stop immediately. Anybody know what that song is? No. It's a song called What Is Life by George Harrison, one of my big heroes. And that's my topic tonight for you people. I'm going to address the biggest question of them all in science. There are many questions in science, as you know. What is gravity? What is time? What's that smell? <laughs> but, but the biggest question, the daddy of them all, the Conor McGregor of questions, is what is life? Now, I've chosen this for a very specific reason. First of all, when I was 15 years of age, I was doing biology in school. And I remember vividly on this particular day, a warm day, probably in May, I was in my final year in secondary school. The teacher came in and he spoke about this thing called DNA and it blew my mind, this double helix. I went, wow, that's a fascination. And from that moment on almost, I became a biologist and eventually took up immunology. Secondly, the second reason I want to talk about this is it's the 75th anniversary. In 1943, Erwin Schrödinger, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, was in Dublin and gave a lecture called What is Life? That lecture is the most important lecture ever given in this university in Trinity. Why do I say that? It sparked a revolution in science. On the back of Schrodinger's lecture and the book he wrote, DNA gets discovered and the basis for life begins to be unraveled. So we're celebrating Schrodinger here today as well. And we're going to go on a journey now, beginning with Schrodinger, through what is life as we now understand it 75 years later and into the future. That's our mission here to answer the biggest riddle of them all. And I want to give you really the majesty of biology as well, by the way. It's a wonderful thing, biology as a subject. And secondly, to let you know that answering this question, what is life, has given rise to huge benefits for humanity, as I'd explain in all kinds of ways. Now, our guide on this journey, a perilous journey we're going to go on, is science. Some people answer this question by talking about God. Forget that, okay? They might talk about poetry. We like poetry, some of us, right? The arts might answer this question. We are here to discuss science. And we're going to use, as our guide, the Royal Society's motto. Look at this. Now, the Royal Society is the oldest society in science in the world. Nullius in verba. Take nobody's word is the motto of the Royal Society. It's based on data. Show me the data. Tell me what the scientific answer is to this really important question. And hence, that's going to be our guide as we go through this. Now, first of all, let's talk about Schrodinger. There he is. He came to Ireland about 1940. Eamon de Valera invited him to be the first director of the, the Institute of Advanced Studies, which is one of our great institutes in Ireland that does research. He takes up the first chair there. And he loved Ireland, Schrodinger. Stayed here for about 15 years. Loved the Irish. He was famous, of course. and won the Nobel Prize for the wave equation you may have heard of. He's also famous for what else? The cat, inevitably. Um, but he was famous for, for, as a famous physicist. And he was really popular here. He became big friends with this man. Do you recognize him? Flann O'Brien. Slight aside here for you. I'm going to tell you now the funniest joke in science. Are you ready for the funniest joke? I've ruined it. I've been saying that already. Flann O'Brien gets to know Schrodinger and they become friends. And in 1941, the obligation on the professor was to give one public lecture a year. And that year, Schrodinger gave a lecture on the quantum world and quantum physics. And he says, there's no need for a cause, was the word physics used, no need for a god, terrifyingly, right? He gave a lecture on this. The second professor in the institute that de Valera funded was the professor of Celtic studies there. That was de Valera's other hobby. He was an expert on St. Patrick. And he said, there's evidence that there were two St. Patricks, okay? The next, which is true, there was a guy called Palladius who came from Rome and a guy from Wales that we know as St. Patrick. The next day in the Irish Times, Flann O'Brien, Miles Nagopoulin says, isn't this marvellous? I'm going to paraphrase him. These two fancy professors on big salaries have made a big breakthrough, the biggest breakthrough ever in Irish science. One of them says there were two St. Patricks and the second says there's no God. And that's an example of the wonderment of science. You know. And of course, Schrodinger then um, gets to know many priests. Look at this picture here. This is from the Institute of Advanced Studies. And here he is in a crowd with de Valera. There are seven priests in this picture. Maybe he was trying to find evidence for a god by working with priests in Ireland. And that was his, his goal at that time. Now, moving on to our big topic, though. In 1943, he decides to give the What is Life lecture. For some reason, he chooses What is Life as his topic. Here's the ad for his lecture. It was in Trinity, the 5th, 12th, and 19th of February, 1943. And he speaks uh, about life and what is life. And, and his goal really was very simple. He says, how can the events in space and time which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism be accounted for by physics and chemistry? That's the question he asks. Sounds a bit complicated. He says two things in his lecture. 
He says, life must have some kind of code script. At that time, the basis for hereditary wasn't known. DNA hadn't been discovered as a genetic material. That wasn't known at all. Schrodinger says there must be some kind of structure that's inherited. He called it an aperiodic crystal. The second thing he talks about is how does life defy entropy? And of course, all living things will eventually decay through the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy builds up. Living systems defy entropy the whole time. He coins this term neg entropy. And they're the two things he writes about in his book. Now, that book is published in 1944. It changes biology completely. Loads of people switch into biology having read Schrodinger's book based on his lecture. And most famously, Watson and Crick. Both of them have said they read the book and they were inspired to hunt down the gene. And we know this because Crick writes to Schrodinger in Dublin in 1953. He says, Professor Schrodinger, Watson and I were once discussing how we came to enter the field of molecular biology, and we discovered that we had both been influenced by our little book, What is Life? Look at this, is sent to King Cor Look at this, Plantarf. He lives on King Cora Road. He then says, we thought you might be interested in the enclosed reprints. You will see it looks like your term aperiodic crystal is very apt. That was a double helix. He sends him a reprint of the double helix paper. Now, seven years ago, I'm in Cambridge on a visit, and uh, I did a postdoc in Cambridge, as our chairperson said, and uh, they had a conference seven years ago of ex-postdocs from Cambridge come back and join us for a conference. I gave a talk, the next guy to speak was Watson, because Watson did a postdoc in Cambridge as well. And I said, I think the next speaker's postdoc was slightly better than mine. <laughs> you know, he discovered the secret of life itself. And I said to him, do you want to go for a pint? And Watson said yes, and he took me to a pub called The Eagle. This is a plaque outside this pub in Cambridge. That's where they announced the double helix. And he takes me to the very table that they announced it at. Here I am at the table, having a pint. Uh, that pint is called DNA, by the way. There's a beer called DNA there. Um, and he said to me at that table that when he was 15, he read What is Life, the book, and that inspired him to go after the gene. And then Watson and Crick then give huge credit to Schrodinger. And that discovery of DNA is a very important part of our, sto our story, really. Now, let's fast forward 75 years. What's happened since Schrodinger with this big question, what is life? Let's use this painting as a good way to address this. This is the famous Gauguin painting. Look at this. It's called Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going? And we can subdivide the what is life question into these three sub-questions. First question, where do we come from? What a big question that is. Now, of course, there are many creation myths, as you probably know. The native indigenous people of Australia think a rainbow serpent shakes the earth into life. That's one possible answer. It may be true. There's no evidence, but hey, we're scientists. So if they find the snake, we'll believe them. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, if you're a Judeo-Christian, which many people might be, it's Genesis, you know. Who would have thought... These great religions will be found on a story about two hippies and a talking snake. Again, <laughs> a snake is in that. This is not science. We forget all that. Where do we come from? We come from this. Very simple. 4.2 billion years ago, a cell arises on Earth, and it's now in Canada, of all places, Canadian rocks. Thank God it's not North uh, USA. <laughs> There's rocks in Canada, and they found evidence of the first cell from 4.2 billion years ago. Conditions on Earth were right to allow the first cell to form. This experiment in 1953 tells us it's simply a matter of chemistry. It was done by two people called Miller and Urey. They set up a, a vessel here with the conditions of the early Earth, all those billions of years ago, with ammonia, methane, and hydrogen, put a spark through it, right? Bubbled it up with a Bunsen burner, let that run for a week, okay, this experiment. They came back into the lab a week later, and guess what had happened? A tiny creature was crawling. Uh, no, <laughs> um, they, they, they found amino acids. Amino are the building blocks of proteins. They published their paper on this. Look at this. This is a paper in Science in 1953, the exact same year as the double helix is published in Nature. This is the Annus Mirabilis for life. These two papers govern what is life. It's metabolic reactions, and then giving rise to DNA, which is the information, of course, the recipe, and these then cross-talk. There's life on two slides for you. You know, this interaction between metabolism and molecules and the information. So basically, we have these molecules, they're forming randomly, and they form the first cell, and now life begins on it through a random process. This is 100% correct, by the way. Now, Secondly, though, very importantly, people have forgotten about energy. You need energy for life as well. And Nick Lane's book is a great book, The Vital Question. It's high time energy joined DNA as the explanation. Obviously, DNA is the recipe. We need energy as well. And energy becomes very important. Early life on Earth was using the heat of the Earth. 
Hydrothermal vents is the source of energy. An amazing thing happens two billion years ago. We plug into the cosmos. Life on Earth begins to take energy from sunlight for the first time through photosynthesis. Two billion years ago this happens, and now we've got a great source of energy, and then life begins to evolve further. And a very important event happens about two billion years ago as well. A strange alliance forms between two cells, two bacteria, get together basically, and they go on to evolve complex life. It's called endosymbiosis. And complex life means us. It means creatures that are descended from this relationship. And complex life shares a lot of elaborate traits, sex, cell suicide, senescence, none of that's seen in bacteria. So to get to complex life, a very strange alliance has to happen between two bacteria. We now call these guys, by the way, mitochondria. They are the place where we make ATP, the energy currency of life. And mitochondria are mind-blowing. They're in every cell in your body. They're descended from this primitive bacteria. And look at this. They make energy by pumping protons across membranes, a very important event. Look at this. 10 to the 21 protons are pumped every second by these things. That's more than stars there are in the known universe. And that's where energy comes from for life. And it happens two billion years ago. So one answer then to where do we come from is the first cell arises randomly via chemical reactions 4.2 billion years ago. Now, we're very egocentric as humans. The second question is, where do we come from? What about us? You know, we came from Africa using DNA to test where we came from, we now know, by comparing DNA sequences. Modern humans arrived 200,000 years ago in Africa. We go to the Middle East 100,000 years ago. Some of us, some of our cousins then end up in Asia, end up in Australia. Eventually, 15,000 years ago, we then go to America. You know, the biggest mistake ever, inventing Americans. Um, <laughs> sorry for any Americans here. Now, of course, we end up in Europe 40,000 years ago. We finally reach Europe. Who do we meet? The Neanderthals and the Denisovans, their earlier hominids. And guess what? We have sex with them. And we're all descended from these matings, amazingly, with these earlier hominids. And now we have great evidence from DNA. This, to me, is a great example of science. Can you imagine we invented a machine to go back in time to sequence ancient DNA, Neanderthal DNA? What a wonderful thing to do. Of course, eventually we invent ships and go and visit our cousins in America, don't we, in 1492. And here we are as Columbus. And what do we do? We kill them. You know, uh, we also go to Australia and we kill them as well. It's a sad history. But eventually, all of Earth is reunited through travel, I suppose. So the answer number two is, where do we come from? Africa and the offspring of these different combinations is our, is our second answer to where do we come from. Now, next big question, what are we? It gets even heavier now. Look at this. Get ready for this. We are made of all these complex chemicals. Okay, And since 1943, there have been 180,000 papers published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry. This massive amount of knowledge, each paper describing a new chemical reaction or whatever it might be. And very interestingly, this year, I'm an editor of this journal, if there are any biochemists here, they did, they did a big assessment about three months ago. What does this journal stand for? What does it discover? And we hope that it will be the molecular basis of life. Do you know what it stands for? Western blotting, tragically, which is a very boring technique. So sadly, even though JVC has all this knowledge, it's intensely complicated. We are made of this. There's 114,000 metabolites in a cell in your body, all interacting. Isn't that incredible? The complexity is huge. Secondly, this makes DNA simple. This is life for kids. It's just a sequence, you know, a linear sequence. This is what life really is, this complex biochemistry. In some ways, we've been seduced by DNA. It's a wonderful double helix, it's the recipe and so on. It's a bit like an income tax law book, very boring, you know, but important just the same. And in fact, we've gone beyond DNA in many ways now to understand life. Even Jim Watson himself has said this, look at this, the belief that sequencing your DNA is going to extend your life is a cruel illusion. If you were going into research today, he would study biochemistry instead of molecular biology. And then he says, I never thought I'd have to, until about two months ago, to learn Krebs cycle, one of these metabolic pathways, terrifyingly. So it looks as if the primacy of DNA is now being superseded. And look at this, another good example. I work on the immune system and how it causes diseases. And variation in the immune system is the basis for many diseases. And it turns out that this variation is non-heritable. It's mainly about the environment. A second area is the microbiome. Our bodies are full, of, our guts are full of this microbiome. Again, that's shaped by the environment. So again, we're moving slightly beyond DNA to explain the complexity of life. But answer number one of what are we? We're information in the form of DNA, obviously, and highly complex metabolic pathways, both interacting with the environment. It's not a straightforward answer. That's what we are. Again, egocentrically, we're also the mind. And this is the biggest question in biology at the moment. What is the mind? If Schrodinger around today, 
That's the question he would ask. We have no idea what the mind is made of. It's a complete mystery. And of course, when Schrodinger asked about hereditary and the double helix was found, that was unimaginable. Mind-blowing that the gene will be this double helical DNA structure. Same with the mind. We have no idea what it's going to be, what the mind is going to be made of. There's various ideas. Uh, Roger Penrose, who gave a lecture in, in 1993 to commemorate the 50th anniversary. It could be these things called microtubules. So we have no idea. You know. But it's bound to involve metabolism and bound to have energy. You know, it's high time energy joined neural networks to understand the mind. So if you're young, go and find out what the mind is. It's the big unanswered question in biology. But certainly, you know, it's synaptic and it's some kind of metabolic pathway. Now, finally, where are we going? We're getting old, as you all know, the aging process. There's no escaping it. And the big triumph of all this DNA work, really, DNA became the tool to study life, and it was massively important, is giving rise to new medicines. This is my own area. There's all these new medicines coming down the track. There's ways to manipulate cells outside the body and put them back in to fight cancer. A thing called CRISPR modifies DNA. You can now grow organs through stem cells. So in many ways, we're heading towards tremendous advances to improve human health into old age, and that's the next step for us. These medicines are coming. It's fantastic. And we will limit the ill effects of aging as we uh, discover all these new fantastic things that have come from Schrodinger's lecture. Without DNA, we couldn't have got to that point of having these medicines. Second question, where are we going? And you know what I'm going to say next. The dreaded robots are coming. Artificial intelligence is coming down the track. They reckon within 50 years at a minimum, the power of AI will supersede the human mind for definite. Can you imagine? And that's Dan Dennett has said this. So that's where we're headed towards. And I think ultimately we will escape biochemistry and DNA. Biochemistry is clumsy, you know, and it's very crude and very unsophisticated and breaks down a lot. That code is just a code. Anything can be used for information. So we'll escape this and become this potentially. Recognize this guy? I love this quote, quote, I'm attempting to fill a silent moment with non-relevant conversation. That's the future, sadly. You know. But the, the answer to where are we going, answer number two is, we'd escape DNA and escape biochemistry. So to summarise, number one, where do we come from? Very simple. First cell, 4.2 billion years ago, improved energy use, complex life. Secondly, evolution leads to us out of Africa. That's where we came from. That's the answer to that one. What are we? Information in the form of DNA and complex metabolites and the mind, the big unanswered question. Where are we going? You can see here new medicines and we will escape DNA and biochemistry. But we'll finish now. There are summary. Let's go back to Schrodinger. He was actually a poet as well. And he wrote many, many poems. Now, many of us are trying to understand the awfulness of existence by doing experiments, say, becoming a physicist or a chemist. Maybe some write poems. Schrodinger tried to do both. He was a crappy poet, sadly, but still, he tried to do both. He writes one poem called Parable. He says, my friend, what in this life weighty and important seems, whether causing dark depression or gladness and rejoicing to fathom nature, merely molecular collisions, he says, right? It's the wonder he was suicidal half the time. But the point about this is, he asked the question, what is life? We are asking the question, us biologists, we're still asking that question. His lecture in Trinity, in the darkest days of World War II, imagine 1943, on the edge of Europe, in a tiny country, on the edge of Europe, he lights a touch paper that turns into a rocket, and DNA, and all the fantastic things happen next, are on the back of his attempt to answer the question, what is life? And that brought great advantages and great success to humanity, and long may that continue. So we must keep trying to answer this question, what is life? Because no doubt we will continue to improve ourselves as a species. Thank you very much.